What stories about the world do we put our trust in? How do we know what experts to trust? There are a lot of stories about Christians and science in our cultural discourse these days, but do these stories really do justice to the reality? As the conversation you're about to hear makes clear, it's much easier to accept certain stories from folks in our own communities because who has time to do all the research yourself? Josh Reeves invites us into a more nuanced perspective. What is really going on when Christian communities are skeptical of certain scientific claims? Josh Reeves is a professor of biblical and religious studies at Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama. He's also the author of a very helpful book called Redeeming Expertise, Scientific Trust and the Future of the Church, which he started writing all the way back in 2015. For those in the academy, see also his article in the open access theology journal called Theologica. The article there is called A Theological Engagement with the Science of Skepticism. Resources on psychological science for theologians are available for free on our website, Blueprint 1543, or at theopsych.com. I'm Sari Martin Concepcion, Director of Communication at Blueprint 1543. I hope you'll enjoy my conversation with Josh Reeves. So I'll just start us off and say I'm talking to Josh Reeves. And you were in our Theopsych second cohort, is that right? You were in the second one? Cool. So maybe you could start off by just like introducing yourself. Like, what are you about? What what do you consider your vocation? Yeah, just tell me a little bit about yourself. Maybe some key questions that sort of drive your research too could be included in that. Sure. I guess the easiest way to, to tell my story in a good evangelical fashion. So Mm -hmm. I went to uh, Sanford, where I teach now as an undergraduate, and I was thinking that I would learn like the great secrets of human nature. I was a psychology major, and I I remember I had read Scott Peck, The Road Less Traveled in high school, and that had made a huge influence on me about understanding human nature and all sorts of things. And so when I got here, Um, I realized that a lot of the classes I was taking were not really those sorts of classes, like the meaning of life, how everything fits together. It was much more uh, cognitive science, much more neurons and rats in cages and those sorts of things, which is great and valid, but it just wasn't really what I was that interested in. So over time, I kind of transitioned more to the philosophy and uh, religion side or theology side. And then when I was done, I was uh, still waiting for my wife to uh, graduate. And I was like, well, I still have this interest in theology. So I did a seminary degree waiting for her. Uh, And then when I was (laughs) done with that, you know, and then I also had, you know, my own questions there. And then when I was done, I, you know, I didn't really feel called to pastoral ministry. uh, And I thought I would see if the academic world would open up for me. And so the questions that I was really interested in was kind of putting together the seminary education and my psychology undergrad uh, and trying to put those kind of questions together. So I found my way to a master's of religion degree program at Cambridge in psychology of religion. And that kind of uh, brought those two together, you know, raised a lot more questions and it answered probably, which is probably a good thing for academic world. And then from there, my question is what to do. And I, I could have stayed at Cambridge, but I would have been a non-psychologist who was specializing in psychology. And I wasn't really sure where that fit in kind of the academic uh, side of things. So I went to Boston University. They had a science and religion program, which kind of more broadened the kind of the questions that I was answering. Uh, and so I would say my academic journey has been a lot of my own personal questions about faith, how science works, uh, how, you know, how the two fit together. And along the way, I found my way back at Sanford and I'm, I'm teaching students here kind of these same sort of questions. I teach a kind of an undergraduate class where we think about, you know, scientific revolution, the Darwinian revolution, all these sorts of questions about human nature and, and what does it mean for uh, for Christians, and what does it mean for just humans in general? That's great. Wow, you've had quite the journey, um, and I didn't know all that about you. 
and I just knew you kind of are all, always showing up in faith science spaces, you know, <laughs> like I saw you yeah. in the AAR at the end of 2019 and one of those faith science things. And I know you were, had, um, you're part of our, the STEAM project when we yes. ha- did that science and theology for emerging adult ministries. So you're just always around when it comes to <laughs> faith and science. Part of that is there is a lot of opportunities, especially with uh, good funding with Templeton and other organizations there. Part of it is um, I'm in a good place because Sanford is a Baptist, historically, traditionally Baptist school, evangelical, but a lot of our students are wrestling with these issues. So it, it tends to attract a lot of grant agencies who are interested in kind of addressing the kind of students that I'm teaching because it's in the Bible Mm -hmm. Belt here. There's a lot of uh, questions uh, and a lot of opportunities to ask those sorts of questions. Right. No, that's that's good. Do you come from a a evangelical slash Baptist background yourself? Yeah, I do. I my mom was kind of a spiritual seeker. And so um, my first part of my life was a very charismatic, like running through the aisles type of church. And then wow. we moved towns and went to like a very conservative, traditional Presbyterian uh, church. And so that kind of like that jarring experience raised a lot of theological questions naturally uh, for me. I would say most of my childhood was kind of a conservative, kind of scholarly, but kind of conservative uh, Presbyterian church uh, in a small town in Florida. Yeah, that's actually my background too. Actually, the church I grew up in was pretty conservative, evangelical, Calvinistic, non-denominational up until I was like uh, early teens and they started like deciding, thinking they needed to join a denomination. They ended up joining the OPC, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, which like nobody does, but (laughs) they did, you know, and um so yeah, that was kind of my background too. And if I if I try to think of anything that I might have been told about science back then, what I what kind of comes up for me is like this: this science has its place, but also this suspicion of that the science is crawling with sort of worldview assumptions that could sort of like accidentally. I don't know, trick you or something, Yeah, which I think is something that you're kind of writing about, right? That's sort of part of the yeah, concern of your book. It's a stated assumption that if you just had a different worldview, the whole science would look different, right? And so what really is presented as neutral, objective science really is just starting with wrong foundations. Yeah, I got a lot of that in the, the kind of uh, church that I grew up with as well. Yeah, but you don't think that's true, right? Um, I would say that there are certain sciences that I think are in some ways theologically entangled, theologically freighted, uh, questions that deal with human nature. There's clearly, I think certain people will come, certain assumptions will read the data differently than others. But the idea that there is a separate Christian science, that if we just had Christian assumptions, a Christian worldview, that we would have an entirely different empirical data set to work with, you know, I don't see that as a very compelling case. I used to perhaps be more sympathetic, but not, not anymore. I think that's well said. I think maybe some of those worldview issues and the assumptions people import, like if you're a scientist, it might actually guide the things that you're interested in. Maybe, Um, maybe you'd have more empirical studies into certain areas that maybe concern Christians more or, whatever the worldview is. But yeah, I, I think that might be one of the main ways and not necessarily the actual observations and the interpretation of the data itself. Yeah. So I think when you get to like the day-to-day work of everyday scientists, oftentimes you can have people in the same laboratory with totally different worldviews, totally different assumptions, and they can agree pretty much on what the empirical out, you know, data coming from that experimental setup is. It's more when you try to tell a story about human nature and when you try to integrate a lot of different studies together into one package, that's where I think more worldview uh, concerns would naturally come up. But I think a lot of times that's more philosophy and really kind of less science. It's more kind of a putting a package together of what science means, which, to be honest, a lot of scientists aren't necessarily worried about what science as a kind of general category means. They're more interested in their day-to-day research. 
So when did you personally become, well, I guess you started out doing science in your undergrad degree, right? You said you were a psychology Mm -hmm. major and then you kind of moved, like, when did you, I don't know, it seems, I guess it was always part of your story, right? To kind of be engaging science and matters of faith. Did it happen sort of in parallel? I would say I was always interested in the questions. I feel like I was always uh, worried about there being some sort of underground worldview contamination. Even into some of my PhD, I would say I was worried about some of that. But I think as I, especially as I start to teach some of these things, and as I got to know scientists, uh, when you have to teach a theory, I think you start to see the evidence that you're like, oh, wait a minute, I didn't really see that before, and I didn't see that. And so when I was able to see things for myself a little bit more, I started to kind of name, not for everything, but especially, I remember, especially things around evolutionary theory, I started to realize that my global suspicion about science was a little bit misplaced. I think skepticism in science is good, but I think this whole worldview, like alternative Christian view of science to me is an evasion of what Christians are supposed to do is engage science rather than uh, being a kind of robust intellectual strategy on its own. So I, I kind of transitioned as I started to both get to know scientists and also get to know the kind of issues and questions that I was uh, coming up with in my classroom. Can you give an example perhaps of some way that the engagement in both the science and faith have created, have manifested something positive and kind of given a more robust answer by working together? Yes. I think for me, it's important to recognize there's always an element of mystery in human nature. I feel like that's an important part of a Christian conception of things, perhaps. I don't know. I know oftentimes Christians refer to the soul but to me, there's this something about human nature that is difficult to pin down from a scientific point of view. And so I've found that as I dig into certain scientific ideas, they both deepen my appreciation for our embodied nature, where, where humans come from, but they also in, deepen my appreciation for the mystery of human nature. So when, mm. uh, you know, I hear stories of, you know, we're nothing but just reductive chemicals working together. I just feel like that so misses the kind of the big picture that I see that both science and theology are sending that to me, that's an unfortunate conclusion to draw from, you know, what the science says in air quotes. Right. So the, just the way in which we seem to be more than the sum of our parts, is that kind of what you're, you're talking about? That's exactly. I feel like they're, is something that you could give a perfect explanation of all the neurons and all, you know, you could open up my brain and look at all the things firing, but there's still something about me and my human experience that is difficult or impossible even to capture in science. And so it's important, I think, as Christians think about science, you think about what science is good at capturing. It's good at capturing things that can be measured and quantified, but also there's so much of reality that kind of falls in the gaps that can't be quantified in that way. That is an important part of telling the human story. And so Hmm. I think any view of human nature that only tries to use science alone and what can be proved empirically is going to be uh, sort of thin in that way. You have used the phrase human nature a lot, and we haven't been talking for like 18 minutes or something. (laughs) So maybe we we should dig into that a little bit more. What are some of the things you mean when you talk about human nature, when you refer to human nature? Mm, uh, That's a difficult question. Um, It is sort of a big tent term. Yeah. So human nature, um, I tend to avoid using it, except in interviews like this, I guess, (laughs) uh, is that because you can mean so many different things uh, by it. And so, you know, what is interesting both about psychology and theology is that they tell a story about ourselves, about how we got here and what we're, what our ends are, what we should be living for and those sorts of things. So you could tell an entirely scientific story about human nature, and it could be one that we're all competing in at war with each other or our genes are trying to 
uh, survive or propagate the longest. Or you could tell, you know, a more Christian story about, you know, sin, fall, redemption, those sorts of things. And so when I think about human nature, I, I tend to find the reductionistic story not that helpful. You know, I do think uh, the Christian story helps make a lot more sense of my life, of even some of the science, I think it helps make sense of uh, the data that I read there. And so I think in terms of human nature, more in terms of stories, what are the stories that we tell ourselves? What are the narratives that we live inside of? So I think the the Christian narrative of fall, uh, redemption, you know, glorification, those kind of uh, narrative is really important for me as I think about human nature. Do you think science can come alongside as a, in sort of a descriptive way? Is that a good term maybe to to use? Descriptive in that, say we, if we talk about the fall and the ways that humans find themselves broken or sinful or whatever, or evil even, um, Mm -hmm. sometimes science can observe some of the particularities of that in a way that is helpful. Yeah. I think oftentimes that Christianity has these intuitions about sinfulness and brokenness, but like the actual mechanism of it, they can be quite agnostic. It could be this, it could be that. And so I do think that oftentimes science is good at telling these mechanistic stories. Uh, you know, there's there's a certain part of us that are embodied. And so our brains operate a certain way. Uh, we treat others a certain way. And so science is good at fleshing out that story in a way that's uh, concrete, that can kind of connect to everyday life. So I find science to be very helpful in terms of, uh, you know, filling in those kind of details in the story. Do you think that studying science and being involved in the faith and science community has given you sort of a more elevated view of what it means to be embodied? Oh, yes. I think I would say that oftentimes, um, one of the, I guess, big picture in terms of the, like, the theology and science uh, conversation, I think oftentimes we don't appreciate the constraints that reality creates for us. Like, why does God work through nature when God can create a miracle anytime? Why would God choose to providentially order certain things certain way rather than just zooming down and doing it supernaturally. And so God works through nature. And I also think God creates bodies for us because the constraints in some ways help uh, create beauty for us. Like the, the, my limited ability, I can't fly, I can't do all these supernatural things, but there's a lot of meaning that you can generate out of living an embodied existence. And so I feel like appreciation for the ways that our bodies set limits on us, but those limits actually set the stage for human flourishing, you know, because if everything was just easy and I couldn't struggle and I couldn't make choices that have real consequences for my life, I don't feel like the story of our lives would be as meaningful as they do now. And so I do feel like the constraint of our own bodies, the constraint of nature is something that both science and scripture shows that God chooses to work through nature rather than against nature oftentimes. Yeah. I mean, I like that framing a lot because it sort of seems like, seems like the maybe, I don't know if how you want to say this. this is a very meta weird question to ask yourself. Like, what, is there a scenario where God could have created an existence for us that was not embodied in, you know, then it, like there must be something better about the embodiment. I don't know. That I, <laughs> that's a very out there question and has a lot of philosophical implications. I know, but just yeah. the idea, just tagging onto the idea that there must be something beautiful about the physicality and the embodiment. Yeah, I mean, I feel like um, it's the central part of the Christian story that God became flesh, right? And so, this physicality is not some incidental feature to our existence. It's actually a key part of both the redemption story and our story. And so um, I do think to just focus on the supernatural and ideas to the extent uh, you exclude the physical and don't take that into account of our theology is, is you're missing something important about the human experience. Definitely. So maybe we could pivot a little bit to talking a little bit more about some of the things You've been exploring in terms of working on the relationship between the Christian community 
particularly the evangelical Christian community and navigating expertise. Did you do a lot of engagement with the idea of cognitive biases or social cognition or anything like that? So in um, the book that I just finished, I did get into that a little bit. And so I think in general, I'm interested in the question of Christian mistrust of science. Where did it come from? What, what reasons do we give? What are some objections that you could raise to all this mistrust that seems to be uh, pervasive around in our current moment? And so one of the chapters that I really wanted to focus on is the science of science skepticism. Because I, one thing I did notice is that when you read popular accounts, when you read newspapers, there's often scientific reasons for why people are skeptical. Sometimes it's framed in terms of like brain mechanisms, and then sometimes it's framed in terms of social psychology that we're just doing what's good for our group rather than what's good for the truth. Uh, and so I wanted to get into that and see what the science or what the studies were actually saying. And I I had some help along the way in terms of uh, going to certain psychologists. But in general, that was, to me, a way to kind of deepen and appreciate kind of a, an alternative angle on this, you know, vast interdisciplinary uh, topic of uh, Christian mistrust. Yeah, I haven't, I didn't get the time to really dive deep in it, but it seems like you're trying to ask that those questions in a more particular way, whereas a lot of times there's just sort of a, out in the cultural consciousness, there might be some ideas that just Christians don't like science or whatever, but yeah. you're really like zooming in and narrowing in and asking, asking like better questions. It seems like it's like, actually, no, it's some Christians have questions about expertise. Like it's more, more specific. Am I, am I right in saying that's what you're yeah. trying to do? So I think a lot of times kind of the assumption is, is that if we could just get rid of religion, then all of us would be rational and we'd make perfect decisions. And one of the things that I took away from the science, which I thought was actually helped me kind of articulate kind of my own viewpoint, was that, you know, we're all, as most people, as lay people, Science, we're not scientists, we're lay people. So we have to take things on trust. And so, so much of our world depends on who we trust, the authorities that we trust. And so what I diagnose as the problem is not that, you know, Christians trust and secular people don't. No, we all trust. We all take in information from sources we believe. It's just, I see in the Christian community that oftentimes we've retreated into echo cha chambers. We haven't really have a good, well-rounded informational diet. And so because of that, it leads Christians to make what I would argue as ill-considered claims. But it's not that human rationality is no longer working for religious people. It's just uh, the ways in which Christians have grown up to mistrust academia, mistrust the government, mistrust other sorts of institutions have created this moment where a lot of Christians are not getting good information about what certain scientific subjects, whether vaccines or, you know, evolution or other sorts of things. Are there some, I guess I'm trying to get you to talk a little bit about the science, just a little bit more. Like, are there sure. some cognitive biases involved in that process of that narrowed bandwidth of trust? Sure. So the way I think about it is that in the psychology literature, there's, three different major answers and that they all give some insight into the problem. So I wouldn't want to say, well, that one's wrong and that one's wrong, but I would want to say that a lot of these are incomplete. So I would say there is a lot of appeals to innate biases in human cognition for why people mistrust certain sorts of scientific claims. And I think that could be in some cases perfectly backed up with evidence. I think some other bias, I think there's sometimes there's an over tendency to read everything as a bias. So I think it can go too far. But clearly there are biases that sometimes we have when we come to think about maybe biology or life or other sorts of things. But I think also the literature shows that these biases, when you teach people about their own biases, they can overcome them. So it's not as this like, immovable force in human cognition that there's no way to get around. It's just you have to be aware of certain biases 
address it in education. But once you do, you can move on and realize that there's other uh, things in mind as you uh, try to teach people about the science and about certain uh, reservations they have about science. So I think the bias is a good example of being a important insight into the story while also not being the complete story. Okay, cool. That's really helpful. So will you give us some some hints as to some of the solutions or helpful ways of thinking through what to do as a, as a lay person when, when hearing, you know, discerning expertise, what's the discernment process of a Christian like and in, in engaging these subjects? Uh, sure. Um, I think part of the first part of the book is really just trying to change the question to from should I trust experts to the question of which experts should I trust? Because once we realize that everybody trusts experts or some sort of intellectual authority in their life, then it doesn't have to be the worry like, you know, why should I trust elites? Well, we all trust people. There's Trust is a part of the human process of coming to know to know this world and know things about this world. And so I think especially psychology can really tell a really rich, fascinating story about trust, especially the stories of, you know, young children in the lab making these claims where it's clear that sometimes children trust, but sometimes they also are critical in their tr- uh, trust as well. And so I think psychology can really help tell the story of why we trust. But then once we tell that story, then you have to get on with the question of like, okay, which scientists, which authorities should we trust? And that becomes a more complicated story. Um, I think part of it is that science is an institution-based process. I think more than any story of scientific method, it's really the institutions of science that make it what it is, the peer review, the ability to challenge other viewpoints, to criticize other viewpoints. And I feel like once Christians, and especially as I help with my students, help them understand the process of science to realize that there isn't any orthodoxy with respect to worldview or other sorts of things, in, at least in good science. You know, there's, there could be some fringes where that would not be the case. But once you understand the process of science and the institutions of science, then it helps you make more discerning choices about, okay, is it more likely that, you know, my uncle at Thanksgiving is right about this? Or is it more likely that a, a ministry that has not a lot of scientists backing it up is right? Or is it more likely that the consensus of scientists who are working on, on a particular project are right? And so just thinking about, like, okay, different sources of information, why you might trust some versus why you might not trust others. So it's really, I think for me, uh, a story of the institutions of science. And then I think you do need to have some sense of the limits of science as well, because I think as you are a discerning consumer of scientific expertise, you need to have some sense of what science is good at and what, what goes beyond the ability of science to answer. Yeah, that's really gradual. And I think what keeps a lot of us from pursuing pursuing truth even in some instances is just time. It's like, oh, that sounds overwhelming. It sounds like a lot of work. And, you know, when I had questions around like the age of the earth and evolution, when I was like, you know, a young adult, I was like, it just seems overwhelming to try to dig into the science of it all. And honestly, what kind of like wedged the door for me, like what started the crack for me being like, yeah, this is what I think was hearing that Tim Keller was like an old earth creationist, you know, (laughs) I was like, and he's not even a scientist. He was just someone in, in my community that people trusted and he's a pastor, you know, (laughs) but that did start like, you know, cracked the door open for me to like pursue information in that direction, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's a perfect example that of course lay people can't investigate all these things for themselves. So they have to take sources. And so the question is what sources are trustworthy and what are not. And for you, Tim Keller was a trustworthy source. And so you were willing to follow along that path. Uh, So the question I guess it raises for Christians is, is the scientific community trustworthy or not? And uh, sometimes I would clearly say yes. I think there's reasons why you could say yes. And then, of course, there's times where the scientific community is messed up and made mistakes, so you wouldn't want to put them on too high a pedestal. But I think in general, 
many sciences uh, can give us true insight into the nature of the world. Uh, and so uh, science can be a, a tool for Christians to think about uh, their place in nature rather than something to oppose as somehow against Christian faith. Yeah, that's really good. That's really good. Can you share anything about your experience working with students when you're sometimes engaging interdisciplinary topics or when you're exposing them to sort of philosophy of science or, or however you do in your, in your um, job? What, what's the reactions like? What, what kind of questions do they have? Any experiences yeah. you could share there? Well, I found uh, for me, um, because the topics that I deal with are interdisciplinary, so it's not really science, it's kind of like the meaning that you make of science. I think the, the approach that always works best is for me to lay out different options for students so they can feel like, okay, I'm being fair to all the different options, and they can see for themselves where they want to place themselves along the spectrum. So I think if I were to come across as an advocate for any particular like view of science of faith, it would actually lessen my credibility in the classroom. But if I can be a fair describer of different views, then oftentimes the students can say, oh, well, you know, I never thought about that before, but there is an objection to this view that I grew up with. And then maybe I think about this. And so the ability to think openly, but also to raise objections to even to all different views in the classroom is actually something I think uh, the students appreciate. It's, uh, it's the ability to think out loud with other students in a safe environment that is much more formative than just to, you know, me lecture them and tell them what I think about um, science and faith. That's super important and super good because part of what, I think part of the fear also with, you know, doing research and engaging expertise is, that you're going to be somehow fooled by this like person who's really smart, but you know, is going to try to fool you into thinking something you shouldn't think. So you have kind of have to learn to trust your own ability to discern Mm -hmm. what's right and wrong. And do I have the critical thinking skills to be able to make that call? Like, Oh, that doesn't seem right. Or why does it seem right? And be able to ask follow-up questions, you know? So Um, I would say like, Trust is an essential part of knowing, but then you also have, as a truster, have to have some critical ability to like, okay, why am I trusting this person? And be able to kind of articulate for yourself why you trust this person versus another person. Because oftentimes it's not thought about, it's very inarticulate. You know, it makes you think of, uh, you know, some people vote for the president based on who they'd want to have a beer with, right? So it's not like they have explicit reasons it's just kind of a a gut feeling and so being able as someone thinking about science to articulate for yourself why uh, you trust one source versus another why you trust one opinion versus the other is is an important part of the growth process uh intellectually speaking this is a subjective sort of question but do you feel encouraged right now or discouraged about this area are you do you see hope? Do you see things improving? Do you see good possibilities for the future in the in in your communities? Well, that's an interesting question because I feel like in the classroom things always feel hopeful because I feel like uh, you see people in a trusting environment. People can agree and people can disagree, and it can always be a productive uh, place for growth and learning. But I feel like maybe one of the problems is that outside the classroom we've lost these public spaces to really reason with each other rather than just talking to your own side and, um, you know, generate outrage about the other side who disagrees with you. And so I feel like being in the classroom gives me hope because there's real conversations, but, you know, watching politics where there's not really, it's not real conversations, most conversations in politics, which is uh, why you could be a little bit discouraged following of those uh, sort of conversations. Totally. It's hard to have in public, public, semi-public spaces, it's hard to have good, nuanced conversations around issues, sort of processing things and not being completely black and white or assigning, you know, essentializing people according to their certain views and then categorizing them on a team that is yeah. villainized or there's a, a lot of that going on and it is discouraging, yeah. but I hope that enough 
like what you're doing in the classroom or maybe what certain churches are trying to do, that there'll be enough more like private sphere conversations like that happening that it'll eventually yeah. ripple out into public discourse. Yeah, I definitely don't think you can rely upon social media because, you know, it's in some ways it's designed to, you know, you're thinking in in public in a performative way, which isn't that helpful because, uh, you know, you're you're performing for the crowd rather than trying to really reason. So I would really love to have a place where churches are seen as a place where you can have real conversations about these sort of things. I feel like if the church is going to help intervene in our particular cultural moment, churches should be as a place to, a safe place to have conversations rather than uh, perpetuating the culture wars that we see outside Mm -hmm. because you know, I don't think that's helping us get anywhere that we want to be. Definitely with you on that. This is sort of pivoting back to the relationship with um, human nature, that sort of big tent term that you don't like to use. Mm -hmm. But were some of the questions that brought you into this space having to do with sort of purpose and the the telos, to use Mm -hmm. the fancier term, of of the human being? What are we for? And what, and I guess if that is the case, then does science come into that at all? Or is that strictly a theological question? Uh, the role for telos and purpose and, and human nature. Like, and yeah, yeah, the relation to, maybe, and maybe that's just not where you were going with like the idea of human nature. But when I think of yeah. human nature, I think of what is a human being and what is our purpose? What are we for? What are we supposed to be doing? And is that strictly a theological question or are there ways in which science can help us answer questions like that? So I would say that there's definite ways that science can help. Oftentimes, and I would have been really helped personally by uh, certain theory, counseling theories uh, in psychology that have been uh, assumed that there's a human purpose in trying to discern certain needs. You know, you think of like uh, the hierarchy of needs by Maslow. In general, um, I feel like that kind of Wisdom can actually really help people understand their place in life and discern why they're having anxiety or other sorts of things. The problem is, is that from a skeptic, that's not really real science because what real science is, is breaking things down to their parts and explaining how the parts contribute to the whole. And so if you have that conception of science, then there can be no such thing as purpose because it's just the the different parts interacting with each other and parts don't have purpose and parts don't have consciousness and parts don't have intentionality. And so when you get to the more empirically based uh, psychology, oftentimes they start losing confidence that you could even talk about intention or purpose, all uh, the sorts of things. And so for me, that just means that you've run up against the limits of what science can explain. If you want to take a very mechanistic approach to nature or to our brains, um, that's fine, but that means that certain things will be left over that you can't explain. And so I would just want to give to science what it can be understood mechanistically, but I would not want to take a mechanistic view of nature. I feel like there's there, there's such a broader and deeper view of reality that is on offer that's more attractive philosophically, theologically, and even scientifically that can't be necessarily grasped using the tools of strict empirical science on its own. That's a really good answer. (laughs) That's a good answer. All right, cool. Well, that's all the questions I had. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about or you you have any other projects you're working on right now? I'm just trying to get this expertise book out. Uh, Hopefully it'll be out in the fall. And then I'm just going to relax and rest. It was kind of, it was like a mountain to climb to get this thing done. It was like a you, five-year project. Yeah, I was going to say, like, you, you started working on it long before 2020. And then 2020 yeah. happened. And it was like, yeah. okay, this probably felt a lot more urgent. And Yeah, it did. I had moments where I thought, I wish the book was already out. And then yeah. I had moments to say, well you know, maybe it'd be good to come out right when things start getting back to, um, you know, maybe not totally normal, but being able to go out to conferences and these sorts of things. So, mm-hmm. so you just kind mm-hmm. of do your best and whatever happens will happen. <laughs> yeah. What can you do? Can't go back yeah. in time. Can you? Redeeming Expertise is the name of the book, right? Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> and I think I will probably change the subtitle and it could probably be uh, Redeeming Science, uh, Christian Mistrust and a Skeptical Age or something like that. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, it'll be very helpful, I think, to a lot of people. 